This is a production of Cornell University. The title of my talk today is Variation in Winter Survival Mechanisms of Wild and Cultivated Grapevine. And I just wanted to point out that I don't like to work with grapevines when they're ugly, green, and filled with fruit. But I prefer to be out in the field in the middle of the winter when it's really comfortable and the vines look like they're dead. But before we get into the actual research, I wanted to give a little bit more of an enhanced uh, introduction to myself. Uh, as uh, was brought up, my background's in molecular biology and plant biology in particular. But my graduate and postdoctoral work was mostly in population genetics and population ecology. And I worked with cultivated and wild rice. And then as I moved on to my postdoc, I worked with bent grass and canola. And so I've had a lot of experience jumping around in different plant systems, and always from a population biology standpoint. So I like to understand crops and their wild ancestors and the traits that we've managed to select from the wild and then use uh, for crop improvement. Throughout my studies, I've always been very interested in adaptation and the evolution of stress responses in plants. I just think it's particularly interesting that plants can't remove themselves from a stressful situation. They have to adapt or they die. And so in the past, I've worked on a number of different uh, stressful conditions from the plant's point of view, including aluminum tolerance in rice and herbicide resistance and drought resistance in canola and bent grass. The other thing I wanted to uh, make a point of is that in jumping around in these different systems and looking at population genetics and population ecology, I tend to also move between the lab and the field frequently. And so I've, I've got a good set of molecular hands, but I also tend to do a lot of experimental work out in the field and in uh, greenhouses like our picture down here on the bottom right um, to set up stressful conditions and try to model uh, how the climate might be changing and affecting plant growth. So then I just wanted to also introduce um, the USDA ARS GGRU or the Grape Genetics Research Unit. Uh, we're based up on the Cornell Extension Campus uh, in Geneva. Inside GGRU, we have two major research programs, uh, which are titled up here. We have a, a research program looking at improving grape rootstock and scion pest and disease resistance, and a second program called the Genetics and Genomics of Grape Growth, Development, and Quality. This is the program that I work in. Inclusive of these two programs, there are five research scientists with associated support staff. Uh, Gan Yuang Zhang is our research leader, and he focuses on functional genomics. Lance Kale Davidson uh, focuses on biotic stress genetics, particularly powdery mildew and downy mildew of grapevine. Chris Owens focuses on fruit quality genetics. Angela Baldo is our computational biologist. And as um, was pointed out, I joined the group a year ago, and my focus is abiotic stress genetics, with focus on cold tolerance, but also dabbling in uh, drought resistance and salinity resistance. So just as a primer, in case anybody isn't familiar with grapevines, um, Vitis vinifera, cultivated grapevine, is one of the most important horticultural fruit crops that we grow. It's consumed as fresh fruit, dried for raisins, or pressed for, ju pressed for juice, or fermented in wine. And actually, about 71% of the grapes that are grown are grown for wine production. Um, Grapevine is really interesting from a population genetics and population ecology point of view. There are thousands of cultivars grown across the world, but many of them are ancient. They, there was something perfect about growing conditions thousands of years ago that farmers vegetatively propagated a certain set of cultivars time and time again. And now those cultivars are grown across the planet in a number of different environments. This is really interesting from the point of view of abiotic stress adaptation. We also have... Um, a sequence genome that allows us to start applying molecular and genetic tools towards understanding how traits are inherited, traits are expressed. From the population biology point of view, there are three different gene pools in the genus Vitis. In Asia, there's approximately 40 species. There's about two European species. Vitis vinifera is the cultivated grape, and its wild ancestor is also considered European. And in North America, we have roughly 20 species. And these numbers change a little bit depending on who you talk to. but this is the general layout of wild vitis. At the USDA in Geneva, we maintain the cold hardy grape germplasm for the United States. I think we have roughly 1,600 different genotypes uh, 
of which we have all the cold hardy uh, varieties. I've listed some of the species here in the bottom right. And these are species names that I'll be using throughout the rest of my talk. Vetus estivalis, Cenaria, Labrusca, Riparia, Rupestris, and Vulpina. And to give you an idea of the distribution of these species, I placed three of them on, on the board here. Um, Vitus riparia is in the top left corner. And if you can see, the, the lime green is a county level distribution of where you can find riparia, records of riparia. So you can see it's really diverse in the type of uh, climates that it could be inhabiting in the US, all the way from southern Louisiana to Manitoba and Quebec, and west to east from Colorado and Montana to the northeast. So you can imagine a lot of different climate gradients exist in that swath of geography. So there's a lot of potential for wild um, grape accessions to carry unique adaptations to some of these abiotic stresses that I'm tasked with working on. I also put up uh, Vitus labrusca and Vitus estivalis just as another comparison in that almost all of these wild species have a very wide geographic range. So all of the different species have the potential to be mined for important traits. I wanted to mention that cold stress response and hardiness is a really complex topic. There's lots of different traits that could be playing a role and lots of different time points throughout the, the growing season that cold stress could be important. It's important to note that cold stress is tissue dependent. If you look at green tissues versus dormant tissues, what the plant perceives as a cold stress could be very different. Um, roots versus uh, shoots perceive uh, temperature, salinity, drought, all very different. So you have to kind of dial down and figure out which traits are going to be workable. There's also a vast ar array of mechanical and molecular mechanisms that contribute to cold hardiness. If you can uh, remove a damaged um, plant organ and avoid a, a cold shock, it's one potential way to get around uh, dam or sustained damage. Or you could have an army of molecular chaperones that help stabilize membranes and proteins when the plant is undergoing a cold shock. Uh, down on the bottom of the screen is my uh, attempt to draw a growth cycle. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that as the plants go from winter to spring through summer to fall and back into winter, there are different points in the growing season that cold can affect uh, the plant survival. In winter, uh, we could have very sharp drops in temperature that kill dormant tissues. And in the spring, after bud burst, frost, unseasonal, or unseasonable frost can damage green tissues. And the same thing can occur in the fall prior to plants having enough time to acclimate and go to sleep before the, uh, the coming winter. These sort of stresses, the tissue dependence and the difference in defense mechanisms are shared across perennial species. And there's lots of variation in what tactics work for different model systems, but in one general theme are these cold binding factor genes, which are transcription factors that seem to be activated by cold and drought um, stress and create a molecular cascade of defense responses. The whole point of cold tolerance in growing tissues is to prevent ice formation from forming inside of living cells. And so this is also my personal um, attempt to draw what cold damage looks like. I don't have an art degree. Um, this is a plant cell on the left with a, um, an attempt at thylakoids, mitochondria, nucleus. Just imagine there's lots of different uh, plant organ or cell organs inside. As the plant perceives freezing stress, it tries to export water to prevent uh, the chance of ice forming inside the living cell. Water can freeze outside of cells and not damage the living tissue. And so um, this is called the high temperature exotherm, where ice freezes and doesn't cause lethal damage. But as temperature continues to decrease, the ice creates a uh, water gradient that causes water to continuously be pulled from the cell. And so the cell starts to uh, be stressed by dehydration. And if dehydration becomes uh, extreme, you can start having membranes fusing together. At some point, the molecular and mechanical mechanisms um, 
that are defenses that are mounted to prevent ice formation within the cell fail, at, and you have ice crystals form within the living cell causing lethal damage, and this is called the low temperature exotherm. If you happen to avoid this, say it gets warmer, water can re-enter the cell as the gradient is switched, and if your membranes have fused together, you can have lethal damage, even though the, t the plant tissue didn't freeze solid, because as the membranes re-expand, they rip apart, and so you lose cellular function. So there's a whole list of potential mechanisms to prevent this cascade from happening. There's avoidance mechanisms like um, supercooling, transporting the water out of the cell, uh, formation of sugar glasses to keep membranes apart, uh, tissue barriers, as I mentioned before. There's also uh, mechanisms that are typically called tolerance mechanisms, where membranes may change their polarity. There may be chaperones and placed inside membranes to prevent them from fusing with one another. Cryoprotective proteins could be produced to help stabilize protein function. And compatible solutes could be produced to uh, increase the, cells or the plant cell's ability to hold on to water even when there is a water gradient. This is what it looks like if you try to put it into molecular terms, the whole process of coal and dehydration stress. As you can see, it's a big mess. Green arrows uh, are promoter arrows. Red repressure signs are genes that function as repressors. What I wanted to just bring up was that you have cold or changes in light or dehydration, some sort of external stimuli. It leads to a transcription factor cascade that culminates here in the CBF regulon. Remember, I, I mentioned the cold binding factor genes. These genes activate a whole series of downstream genes uh, called core genes and kin genes, many of which we don't know what they do, other than they lead to the production of cryoprotectants and um, compatible solutes, sometimes soluble sugars, all which are thought to help with that uh, prevention of lethal dehydration and ice formation within the cell. So there's many different aspects of cold stress and hardiness. There's dormancy and reduced deacclimation, so how the plant perceives winter is coming, how it goes to sleep and then reactivates in the summer or the spring. Midwinter bud survival is understanding how buds can survive lower and lower temperatures without having that internal ice uh, occurrence and then survival against spring and, spring and fall frost. But one thing that pops in my mind is maybe we don't need to worry about uh, cold tolerance if climate change is occurring and global temperatures are rising. We just need to wait a couple more years and then winters will be 70 and there's no reason for me to have a job. But if you think about the way that climate uh, change is predicted to occur, there are supposed to be more and more erratic weather patterns and so there's the potential for rapid changes in temperature exposing green tissues to freezing conditions. And this is an example of what hap when that happens. Uh, this is pictures from space. In uh, 2006, if we look at early April, what the phenology of the United States looks like versus 20 days, roughly 20 days later, you can see that there's a lot more leaves, a lot more bud burst in those 20 days. Mind you, this is from space, but... This is what it looks like in April of the following year after they've had a very, very warm month of March. So phenology has advanced by several weeks, and this must sound very similar to what we had this past year. So phenology gets advanced a month early. Then we have a return to normal cold spring temperatures that wipes out uh, early green tissues. And so you can see that the, the dark green has been completely reset uh, to the lighter green, showing you that there's been a lot of damage. And it's estimated that this particular Easter freeze caused somewhere around $2 billion worth of agriculture and horticultural damage, impacting lots of our, our standard crops, wheat, rye, barley, and corn, and then all of our fruit crops, which they're listed down here at the bottom. So this is the sort of climate, uh, swift changes in climate that we're worried about as far as cold tolerance goes. This is why I should keep my job. So green tissues are very cold, tender, and they can't survive long bouts of freezing. And on grapes, this is uh, important to note because grapes are primarily fruitful in the primary bud. The inflorescence meristems are laid down the year before, and so 
whatever bursts out of that primary bud is where you're going to get your fruit and your harvest from. So if you get a killing frost in the early spring that kills off the first bud, the plants will usually survive because they'll push buds from ter secondary and tertiary buds, but they'll be far less fruitful if they produce fruit at all. So this is really bad from the farmer's point of view. And this just illustrates what that sort of frost kill looks like. So that's the end of the background. I was just going to now tell you about three sort of preliminary studies that we're conducting to try to get at looking at cold, uh, grapevine cold tolerance. So the first one's going to be looking at dormancy, chilling, and deacclimation in wild uh, grapevine. Then we're going to look a little bit at midwinter, midwinter bud hardiness and finish up with a little discussion on osmotic mechanisms that could be contributing to midwinter hardiness. So to start, acclimation and dormancy. And I apologize if this is a little too redundant. I'm not sure where everybody is on cold tolerance. So um, as far as uh, dormancy goes from the, prospect, or from the point of view from the plant, there are several different stages. During the growing season, basal buds are thought of as being paradormant, which is right here, where apical buds are suppressing the growth of those buds through hormone control. As the uh, plants enter fall and they start receiving lower temperature cues and light temperature cues, you have a, a change in molecular and metabolic status that tells the plant to start going to sleep. So this is called endodormancy, once the plant's gone fully to sleep, but we really haven't gotten to the middle of winter here. The final stage of dormancy is ecodormancy. Eco this occurs after endodormancy has been fulfilled by currently some unknown factor and the plant is ready to grow. The only thing keeping it from growing is the fact that it's still winter. So the environmental parameters of growth are not favorable. When those are lifted, growth resumes in the spring. And so this is sort of what the curve in dormancy looks like, uh, pictured here on the bottom left. Uh, acclimation takes place over several months. The deepest hardiness in dormancy occurs in the middle of the winter. And then as you enter spring, deacclimation and resumption of growth occurs at a much faster rate than the plant took to become acclimated in the beginning, in the beginning of the year. The amount of cold that the plant needs to experience to fulfill endodormancy is important because if the plant doesn't achieve that magical number, when you return to growing conditions in the spring, buds will not burst synchronously. So you'll have growth occur on grapevines, but they'll it'll be a spotty one bud here, one bud there. Desynchronized bud bursts leads to very desynchronized flowering and desynchronized fruiting, desynchronized ripening, and so farmers don't want to be harvesting grapes at multiple time points in the fall. They want to go through and get it all at once. So it's very important to have grapevines that are able to satisfy the endodormancy, the chilling requirement, prior to the growing season, depending on where they are. So this, this leads us to this idea of a, a dream grapevine. So if you're growing grapes in a warm climate, you want a grapevine that goes to sleep in the winter, but only needs a small winter, because you only have a small winter, and that will, leading to grapevines that will then burst synchronously in the spring. In cold climates, we don't mind so much how long the chilling hours are, because our winters are plenty long. What we want is a grapevine that comes out of dormancy and kind of takes its time slows itself down because otherwise you end up with what we ended up last year. You have grapevines pushing in the early spring followed by a sudden frost and we lose part of our crop. So it depends on where you're growing grapevines on what sort of traits you're looking for. So what we do to assess chilling requirement uh, in wild grapevines is we go out to the germplasm uh, in November, early November, and take cuttings right after the first killing frost, the one that the frost that knocks down the leaves. We collect a whole bunch of canes and put them in a cold room at five degrees C. Five degrees C is sort of the sweet spot for the cold clock in grape. As long as they're held at five degrees or lower, they start counting towards the end of that endodormancy. We then take the cuttings out of the cold room at several time points during the winter and put them in forcing conditions and see if they're ready, if they've fulfilled that endodormancy time limit. And this is just, on the picture on the left here is, what the experiment looks like. It's just a bunch of cuttings in a growth chamber, and we go down and assess whether or not they're growing. This is what the data looks like 
from one of these experiments. Pictured here is results from the cultivated gra grapevine Cabernet Sauvignon. And we have sort of a um, randomly chosen time point to assess when endodormancy has ended. And that's at, f at four weeks. If 50% of the buds have burst after four weeks in uh, forcing conditions, we consider endodormancy to be fulfilled. And so you can see here that for Cabernet Sauvignon, we don't really call um, the 50% bud burst until, uh, I, oh yeah, Geneva can't see my pointer. I keep forgetting that. Uh, I would say around 1,000 hours of cold. So if you look at this graph, the far right line is the darkest red line. That's zero hours in the cold. We cut it from the field, put it in a growth chamber. And then as you step back in lines and in uh, more and more pink color, these are time points where the, the cuttings have been in the cold room for a longer and longer period of time. So you can see that it takes about 1,000 hours for Cabernet Sauvignon to be ready to burst. And the other thing I want you to note is the longer that you keep them in the cold, the faster they burst and the more synchronous they burst. So there's a couple different clocks going on here, an ultimate clock and then one that you can speed up over time. So Jason, what was the preferred? The preferred was to have 50%, say that again, 50%. That's kind, of the, that's kind of the journal level cutoff for endodormancy is 50% bud burst at four weeks in forcing conditions. Okay. That, it could be a little subjective though. So I'm not going to show you tons and tons of graphs, but I wanted to show how we have variation within the germplasm samples that I'm evaluating from the field. We have genotypes that require very low amounts of chilling. So on the top of the, the slide here, we have Riesling and then uh, wild species Vitis riparia from Manitoba. And you can see for both of these cultivars that they satisfy their endodormancy with very little chilling. And they, um, with increased chilling, you actually have with the uh, riparia from Manitoba, they don't require any start. At seven days, they've burst to completion. So they're very fast out of the gates after a certain amount of cold. We also have genotypes that require high amounts of chilling. And here's two wild species, Vitis vulpina on the left and Vitis rupestris on the right. And you can just see by looking at the distribution of the lines that they require a lot more chilling in order to satisfy that bud burst requirement. This is another way of looking at the data. Um, if you look at, if you take all the cuttings that were placed into the growth chamber after 500 hours of chilling, this is how, how many days it, they require before they burst. So it gives you an idea that there are, there are some varieties that will not burst at all. 60 hours actually means never burst in this experiment. So these buds, though they're totally viable, don't burst after eight weeks without chilling. So they need this chilling in order to get that counter going. Over time, you can see that they get better and better in bursting with um, increased chilling. The other thing I want you to note is that there's a big difference between, in this example, amurensis on the bottom, which requires very little chilling and bursts faster and faster and faster, and vulpina, which requires a lot of chilling. And even after 2,000 hours, it's increased its chilling time, but it can never really match the speed of amurensis. And so there's got to be some genetic control over the clock and the speed of that clock. Picture on the bottom is uh, three accessions of Vitis vulpina and three accessions of Vitis cinerea, just demonstrating to you that we have variation within a species for the response as well. And in vulpina, you can see that all three varieties start out together the same. And then as they accumulate chilling hours, they start to diverge in their ability to hit any particular uh, bud burst speed. Scenario is kind of the opposite in that with very little chilling, the three varieties are very diverse in their response, but then as they accumulate chilling hours, they converge on a set. Uh, in this case, it's three weeks to bud burst after 2,000 hours. So this is um, just to illustrate some of the phenotype that we're trying to understand um, with dormancy and bud burst rates in wild germplasm. We want to also understand how this might relate to midwinter bud hardiness. This is the trait that's been the focus of the majority of um, grapevine breeding for cold hardiness. And grapevine breeders have typically used Vitis riparia from northern locations in breeding programs. And it's been very successful in uh, 
conveying midwinter bud hardiness. And I've placed up here two examples, Marquette and Frontenac, both of which are able to survive to temperatures of negative 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the problem with this may be that Bidis riparia sessions can be very prone to early bud break. And I, I put down here again the Manitoba sample that I showed you before, that after a long winter, they're able to break bud after one week. So in a situation where we have a really warm March and then a very cold April, something that carries a lot of riparia background might be more susceptible to frost uh, damage. So we want to understand how genotypes differ in midwinter hardiness in order to um, make good breeding decisions. So we assess uh, midwinter hardiness using uh, digital thermal analysis, which is looking at that low temperature exotherm that I pointed out in my cartoon, the temperature at which the water freezes inside cells signaling lethality. We do this by uh, excising buds from the field, putting them in this nifty programmable freezer, uh, lowering the temperature over time. And as the water inside the bud goes from liquid to crystal and it freezes, there's a small release of heat, which is registered as a change in voltage. And we're able to observe at what temperature buds die. And so here, pictured um, in the graph, you can see two strong peaks here. These are two primary buds from two bud cuttings as the temperature um, caused lethal damage. And then a very small peak afterwards, which is probably a secondary bud that was still attached to the cutting. Secondary and tertiary buds tend to be a little bit hardier. So we can track these hardiness values throughout the season. This is what last winter looked like. These are daily min and max temperatures uh, with the freezing point illustrated here in the horizontal black line. Um, I do apologize, I flip between Fahrenheit and Celsius frequently. Um, sorry about that, I didn't realize it until I was uh, practicing this. Just go with relatives. We're always below the freezing point in these graphs. So what you can see with our winter is it was uh, pretty warm in November and December, it got a little bit chilly, then around New Year's we got a pulse of very cold weather, then another few days of very, very cold weather warmed back up and we had a super warm March. And if you were to see this go, you'd see our April come crashing back down on the other side. If we look at uh, the DTA results for Vitis vinifera, Cab Franc, and Riesling, um, these are the values from this past winter. This is the LT50. So if the temperature had dipped down and intersected with one of these lines, we would expect about 50% of the buds on that plant to have been killed. And you can see Good news, nobody had that problem this winter. I, I should also mention that this is all data that's been collected in collaboration with Tim Martinson, who runs the extension on the Geneva campus. His group does all the collection of the buds uh, and the DTA runs, and then I do some downstream processing. This is what it looks like if you look at uh, hybrid varieties, Concord and Noiré. And you can see, um, a similar pattern to the vinifera in that they decrease with temperature over time, uh, but then they get much more responsive to switches in temperature. So dips uh, in low temperature cause dips in the uh, DTA. So Concord and Noiré are able to respond to that cold signal better or faster than the vinifera cultivars. This is what it looks like if you overlay them, just so you can get an idea. Now, mind you, none of these cultivars experienced damage. They were all plenty hardy. But it's still interesting to me that the hybrid cultivars are able to respond at points when the vinifera cannot respond, or, or chooses not to, does not respond. And so I'm interested in understanding if that is a trait that correlates with the wild germ plasm, and if that's something that we can select on. This is an uh, example of the data that Tim Martinson's group puts, puts up for farmers. So farmers have access to this data throughout the winter so they can make choices about their pruning technique, whether or not they need to account for damage to their vines. And you can see in 2009, 2010, Cab Franc and Riesling, uh, well, well below the hardiness line needed. If you look at Cayuga White and Concord to hybrid varieties, you can see that they're much more responsive in the LT50 curves. And then if you look in the 2010-2011 season, at, again at Concord, you can see that's very reactive to temperatures. So I'm really interested in understanding what the control is of that ability to move. The other thing I wanted to point out 
is that these changes in LTE are temperature responsive. It's not like a age over winter. It's responding to accumulating cold temperature. Pictured on the left of this graph, uh, graph are riparia cuttings, one kept in the cold room, one, kept, one collected from the field. On the right is Volpina, same situation, cold room and field. And you can see that with the field exposure to cold, the uh, LTE values for the field riparia and the field Volpina are much, much hardier, much lower than if they were kept in the cold room under those dormancy uh, inducing conditions. So I want to understand what promotes the change in hardiness and what the physiological mechanism is behind it. This is the data from this year, uh, looking at LTE values obtained from wild germplasm. And you can see the uh, vivinifera and, and hybrid genotypes are pictured on the right-hand side of the graph in color. All the black um, graphs are, or bars are wild germplasm. And you can see that it far exceeds the ability of vinifera at this early point in the season. I've color-coded uh, riparia blue and vulpina pink here so that you can see that there's wide variation in the ability to uh, get increased cold hardiness within species. Within riparia, we're seeing six degrees difference between the samples we're, we're looking at. And in vulpina, we're seeing a four degree difference. And I'm wondering if midwinter hardiness and deacclimation right can be pulled apart. This V. riparia on the right hand here from Iowa represents this negative 17.6 level of hardiness. The one on the left from Manitoba represents the negative 23.5. So the question is, if you're super hardy, does that make you always deacclimate quickly? So are these separate modules that we can select apart, or, or is it one adaptive complex that's been transmitted through time? And so we gotta, we're working on figuring that out. The last thing I wanted to tell you about was um, trying to get at the physiology behind what could be in, uh, increasing the bud hardiness. And so we looked at whether or not sugar type or concentration uh, could determine cold hardiness in these four varieties um, that Tim Martinson's group works on. We have a lot of data from uh, other perennial systems and also from grape that suggests that cold hardy varieties tend to have higher sugar concentrations and that dormant buds, um, at least with uh, grape, tend to accumulate higher levels of raffinose in uh, hardy buds than in sensitive buds. So we looked at the sugar levels in those four varieties, Concord, Noiret, Cab Franc, and Riesling, to see if there's a correlation between their bud hardiness and sugar throughout the whole season. So the four sugars we look at are pictured here at the bottom, uh, glucose and fructose monosaccharides. Sucrose is a disaccharide of, the, of glucose and fructose. And raffinose is a sucrose molecule with galactose added on. Um, and so these sort of represent a carbohydrate pool that could be moving back and forth uh, between trisaccharide and monosaccharide states. And so we thought maybe, maybe one of these sugars will tell us something about hardiness, but it could be that it's the flux between the four that actually have something to do with it. So this is what it looks like if you look at sugar concentrations in those four varieties. Cabernet Franc and Riesling are on the left side, Concord and Noiret are on the right. And what I want you to notice is that sugars oscillate greatly throughout the season. This is the same winter season that we just looked at, bud hardiness. So they go up, they go down. Um, they always seem to go up and down together. So there doesn't seem to be a pool trade-off where we have sucrose decreasing and then glucose and fructose increasing, but that all the sugars seem to more or less be moving together. The other thing I want you to notice is that Concord and Noiret tend to have much higher sugar levels uh, for all sugars, as well as total sugar, than the uh, two vinifera. So if we look just at glucose and raffinose, um, you can see what I just explained, that Concord and Noiret, Noiret have much higher sugar levels throughout the entire season, and that Riesling, which is the more hardy of the two viniferas, also tends to have more sugar. So it looks like the sugars are correlated with bud hardiness. Um, but we wanted to test this by looking at 33 different wild varieties to see if maybe this is just a cultivated phenotype or if this is something that occurs across the whole genus. Because what we don't see is the sort of correlation that you would hope to see between sugar and uh, DTA values. 
So pictured here, on the left is Concord, on the right is Riesling. Um, the, the top colored line is total sugar, and I've just collapsed all four sugars together because they cycle together. And so it's easier to look at one line than it is to look at four. Um, so you can see how sugar, total sugar levels cycle throughout the winter. Pictured behind the sugar is the daily temperatures. And then on the bottom is the LT50 for Concord. And so if sugars were playing a direct role, we would expect then as the LT50 decreases in Concord that we see sugars increase in opposition if they're the, the driving mechanism. We do see that the coldest point in Concord's hardiness uh, correlates with the highest point in sugar, but it's pretty arbitrary difference between the high points. If we look at Riesling, um, we see something very similar. Lots of oscillation without changes in hardiness and no dramatic increase in hardiness that correlates with sugar level. So it doesn't appear that the sugars are driving hardiness. It does kind of look like sugars are cycling with winter temperature. And this might just be because I stare at these all the time. But it looks a little bit to me like, at least in the beginning of the winter here, Concord seems to be cycling at sugars, along with changes in highs and lows. After our first real cold freeze, the sugars kind of depart from that pattern. And I don't know, that may have something to do with fulfillment of dormancy or some other physiological marker that we haven't covered yet. Um, so right now we're looking to see if the sugar level correlation falls apart when we look at lots of different varieties and with lots of different hardiness levels. Um, and we also need to make a point of noting that there could be some other environmental parameter like our winter. Maybe our winter was it was awfully warm, and perhaps these correlations start to fall apart in, when you have less severe winters. There's lots of other parameters that we haven't considered yet. The final thing I want to leave you with is that these are all characterization and phenotyping uh, research projects that we're getting off the ground to try to understand which traits are the good ones to go after for breeding. We're also taking a genetic approach to mapping some of these cold hardiness traits. We have several segregating populations between hybrid varieties and wild varieties. Um, and we'll be screening them for chilling requirement, bud burst, LTE, and osmolite levels. And pictured here is just an example of what we've been able to look at so far. This is sugar level in one segregating pop or one population. Pictured in the two blue arrows in the bottom left corner are the, parent, the parents of this cross. So you can see that the two parents produce almost essentially the same amount of sugar in their buds, but their progeny produce this huge transgressive array of sugar concentrations. And so we're, we're hoping to look into this some more and see if we can figure out if we're starting to pull traits apart. So I was just going to wrap up with that cold stress is, um, cold stress and cold hardiness is a suite of traits. It's really complicated and we're working on trying to pull things apart into manageable bits. The wild germplasm that we have access to uh, carries variation in these traits, and we need to draw on those um, traits in order to improve grape germplasm. You could see from the cold hardiness that uh, cold hardiness of vinifera that both Riesling and Cab Franc kind of go down in the middle of winter, but they table off. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity for us to improve uh, grapevine. The mechanism of cold hardiness really isn't clear at this point. Sugar level might have a role in it, but it does not seem to be the driver, at least with one year's worth of data. And please stay tuned. This is the first year. I'm hoping to come back several times and tell you more and more as the story progresses. And thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Well, so not with the four that we're looking at. Though they were all moving in sync. It's possible that they're being hydrolyzed from starch reserves. We did not look at starch. Um, but that's the only place that I know where they could be coming from. No, that's a great question and a great point. This hasn't been corrected for anything like that. And the, the investigation into the responsiveness for hardiness, we just initiated that this year. So hopefully I'll be able to give you a little bit more input on that after this year. The, uh, the samples that we're running include both male and female vines, um, but as you pointed out, the, our germplasm is not run like a vineyard. 
we, we don't control crop load, we don't control vigor at all. And so really I need to team up a little bit more with a viticulturist who could give me a hand with understanding that um, we could probably deploy some things with fruit removal in a, in a vineyard setting and see how that affects it. But right now I don't have the answer for you though. Mm. So the reason we kept them at five degrees C is because that's the, d the temperature of our cold room. But the uh, literature on chilling requirement is the chilling portions that perennials tend to count begin below seven degrees C and stop at zero. So we want to keep it in that sort of sweet spot for uh, chilling fulfillment. So we could definitely try uh, treating at zero over the long term. Um, I don't, we would have to make sure that the plants were acclimated sufficiently so they could be held below zero for you know, 2,000 hours. But, um, but it's, a, it's a good comment. OK. Yeah, we could do that. We, um, the dry weight, just to give you some background on the me method there, uh, we tried processing these buds fresh, well, well, fresh from the LTE experiments, and found that when we tried to process them, mechanically process them and grind them up, and they were wet, that we got less sugars extracted because of the way that the grinding was working. So we've been freeze drying them uh, in order to make pulverization easier. But your point is good, and it would be easy enough for us to take fresh weights. Yeah, um, fresh is mm -hmm. water content. Yeah. Because I don't know how much uh, change the water content is during the winter. Yeah, it's, it's probably pretty slight given, because these buds are very tiny and they weigh very little to begin with. But it makes sense that if they're increasing their osmolites, yeah. I think that's a very interesting question. I don't know if um, rootstocks impact scion hardiness. But if we need to try, maybe graft the same scion onto a bunch of different rootstocks and watch. Um, based, on, based on what we expect the buds to be going through in winter, they're, they're more or less physiologically sealed off from the cane. Um, Hopefully they're responding on their own, and if that case, if that's true, then I guess you wouldn't expect rootstock to contribute much, except for rootstock to be contributing much through the growing season. So we could definitely test it. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. It's it's another trait we could be looking at and having an impact on it. I haven't looked on it um, mostly because I don't know a whole lot about wood physiology, and it's a I'm a work in progress. But um, it, it makes sense that if you had a greater capacity to transport carbohydrates, that perhaps you could elevate that level prior to winter and come start off at a hardier level. Um, the only thing I would say is that we expect that the buds are not drawing on the cane tissue so much throughout the winter. Once they've, once they've shut down, the pearderm has moved through, the leaves of senesce, we're not expecting there to be a ton of communication metabolically or uh, molecularly going on, but we don't know. So I'm hoping for the sooner rather than later. Um, I don't know when, the, I don't think it's so much the price point. Um, it's untangling how messed up the genetics of grapevine actually is. So if you look at vinifera, it's super heterozygous. These are combinations that were formed a long time ago and preserved in a state um, so when you compare between varieties, we run into a lot of problems um, just mapping known genes because they move, inversions, deletions, this sort of thing. When we move to the wild species, you know, it just gets crazier from there. I can tell you that we're all, the whole GGRU group is interested in pushing forward um, sequencing in these wild species, and we've, we've been working on it, trying to get some of the wild species as a reference genome so that we can, when we do those mapping populations, we need to be able to mark, uh, map the markers. And at this point, we still lose a lot of markers because there's no reference location for them in vinifera. And so we're working on it. I certainly hope it's in the next years or so. We did the, the Iowa yeah. riparias in there. And then we also um, we had one from Quebec in that study as well. That's not south. But I thought our experiment wasn't working when I got that data, um, because the Manitoba riparia went so quickly, um, 
we have collaborators in South Dakota who also work with this riparia, and there, riparia takes 1,500 hours. Our experiment, it took nothing. And so we, we kind of put our heads together and thinking about that, and one thing to note is that there's chilling going on before we get the cuttings. It's not, a, not anywhere near 2,000 hours, but every night it gets cold, it's that clock is going, they're counting. So depending on how your fall transition from summer to winter is, how steep that transition is, that can really change what that zero point is. And so what we came up with is in South Dakota where you have the rapid transition, it's hot, 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 short fall, deep into winter, it counts a lot slower because it can only count every time that comes back above zero, zero and seven, you know, so it takes a lot longer under that climate. Here we have a lot of cool nights, so it starts counting way before we can actually go to the germplasm and make dormant cuttings. So that's what our thought is with why something so northern would appear to not need chilling at all. I think it really does need chilling. It just starts that clock much earlier than we are able to measure. So this year, we've got, we're counting chilling hours prior to our zero point to see if that changes our scale at all. Um, and we're doing it a across a much wider uh, swath. Your zero point meaning just the time you split yeah. the Yeah, November 7th was, was when we did it. Because we, we need to wait for the plants to go dormant enough, they drop their leaves, that we can go out and cut cuttings from our germplasm. Some riparias are, are very photoreceptive. The provenance of the Manitoba province versus the Iowa province. You would expect mm. they would go dormant earlier. If they're, if if they're, they're well, that's if the clock, if the photoreceptor clock is tied into the cold clock yeah. in that case. And some riparias are very photoresponsive and they drop their leaves well in advance of the first frost and others hang on to it. And I don't think I have that data from our germ plasma. In this, year, in this year's study, we expanded the riparias to include, we have one population from Texas. So we've got, excuse me, Texas and Iowa and Manitoba, and we're hoping to see things start to pull apart there. Oh, I saw it this year too. Uh, our Asian varieties, Amurensis, bursts very early. And so they were all leafed out when we had that, uh, that scary frost. And the viniferas were still quiet, they, they were safe. But I did see a lot of burning on the stuff that had burst in our um, germplasm. And I agree with you completely in that within a vine, you could go out there and it was almost like, like here it took out all six buds and this whole vine over here is totally fine. And then in the next vine over, it's every other bud. And I don't, I can't think of any reason that there would be site to site location differences. I suppose there could be something along the lines where certain buds incurred a, a non-lethal amount of damage through the winter, which makes them more susceptible to frost in the spring. So they're just weaker bursts. And to us, they look fine. Um, I do think the microclimate's a possibility. If you get um, an eddy or just a local drop of a few percents of a degree, it might be enough to cause that lethal um, symptom. So yeah, I'm not sure. We would have to, ca we would have to Categorize it, right? Yeah. There's something going on there that, mm -hmm. that may actually have some clues. Yeah. And that's ultimately what, one, what I would love to be able to say I deployed was grapevines that have green shoots that come out in the frost in the early spring, and it doesn't matter what frost you get, they have a greater capacity to shrug it off. So that's probably going to take a couple more years, though. Thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.